Hey all, it's that time of year again, and you know what that means. It's time to talk about the Commodore 64. It's time to talk about the Tandy 1000. I'm Matt D'Amico, and welcome to episode 44 of Retro Bits. The Tandy 1000 was released in 1984 for a price of 1200 US dollars, or just under 3200 adjusted for inflation. The system was essentially a clone of IBM's unsuccessful PC Junior, but featured an improved keyboard, greater expandability, and a higher level of PC compatibility than did IBM's own offering. Introducing a computer that can change the way you work. The new Tandy 1000, complete with deskmate software for easy to use word processing, filing, worksheets, scheduling, communication. Brought to you by Tandy, clearly superior for service, support, and software. The Tandy 1000, available at Radio Shack Computer Centers and so affordable. Tandy technology, service, and support are clearly superior. The PC Junior was not a market success, selling only around a quarter million units over its short 12-month run prior to being discontinued. The 1000, however, was a winner for Tandy and Radio Shack, spawning numerous subsequent models over its nine-year span. Now, I've never owned or used a Tandy 1000 before, although I did have some early PC experience back in the day with a second-hand IBM 5150. After last year's Septandy, I got motivated to try and find a good deal on eBay, which eventually led me to this auction. A bit yellowed perhaps, but otherwise the machine appeared to be in good physical condition. The original keyboard was missing, and the seller claimed the Tandy wouldn't power up, but I hoped it would be a trivial repair. For $75, it seemed like an acceptable risk, so I pulled the trigger. The machine arrived well packaged and appeared to have survived shipping, but if you've seen the most recent unboxing video, you know looks can be deceiving. What we have here is the very first of the Tandy 1000 models. This particular example was configured with dual 360K floppy drives as delivered. The front panel features a reset button and proprietary ports for the keyboard and two game controllers. This early example of the product line features an Intel 8088 processor running at 4.77 MHz. 128K of RAM is standard equipment, with the system being expandable up to a maximum of 640K. As an XT class machine, the 1000 does not support extended memory. Unlike many of the first PCs, the 1000 incorporated many of the basic peripherals directly on the motherboard, simplifying the system and leaving the expansion ports free for other add-ons. All 1000 models featured the enhanced sound and video from the PC Junior that offers 16 color graphics and three voice audio. In addition, a PC compatible dual floppy controller and a parallel printer port are standard equipment. The original 1000 sported only three 8-bit ISA expansion slots, while subsequent models came equipped with five. This machine is actually a 1000A model that utilizes a cost-reduced and enhanced mainboard that features an optional math coprocessor slot not found on the original revision. Along the back of the machine, we have an internal power supply with the aforementioned printer port directly below. A light pen input is found on some of the earlier models, but such add-ons were expensive and not many software titles supported them, so the port was dropped after the 1000SX. Video output comes in the form of both digital RGB with intensity as well as composite. An RCA connector for mono sound is also provided should the internal speaker fail to impress. An AC powered fan and the expansion slots round out the features of interest here. Finally, the power switch can be found on the right hand side of the machine, similar to, but not as satisfying to operate as earlier IBM systems, the PC Junior excluded. In the last unboxing video, I opened the machine up to see what I was dealing with vis-a-vis -vis the power supply and was met with an unpleasant surprise. Apparently, neither of the expansion cards were secured in their slots and had come loose during shipping. The first card didn't show too badly, just a few bent pins. But the second is a heavy, bulky, and fragile hard card. 
It looks like it banged around pretty good, dislodging and mangling the BIOS and clock chip in the process. Further, it looks like the hard card dragged its bracket along the ISA slot, damaging as it went. I'm going to have to replace this for sure. The first card is a 512k RAM expansion with DMA controller. The original 1000 didn't implement DMA on the mainboard, but it's a necessity when adding a hard drive controller. It can also improve the speed of disk operations by allowing data transfer to and from RAM while bypassing the CPU and it can even help increase the system's PC compatibility in certain situations. The other expansion is an integrated hard disk and controller, or hard card. The chances of this working after its rough ride are pretty slim, but the only external damage appears to be the bent bracket. Now, my machine is not a 1000 HD model, so it was probably upgraded with these parts at some point during its service lifetime. These parts weren't exactly cheap in their heyday, to get the full 512K, you'd have needed to purchase both the 256K expansion board plus an additional RAM upgrade for a total cost of up to $550. The hard drive controller was another 300 on top of that, even before adding a 10, 15, or 35 megabyte hard disk. The last unusual thing I found was that the part number of the BIOS chip indicates it's from a later 1000EX model. My understanding is that it was common to upgrade the original 1000 BIOS for hard drive support, but I'm not sure if that's necessary with the A-Revision that I have. Further, I believe that the EX from which this chip came is able to boot DOS and Deskmate from ROM, so it'll be interesting to see what happens when I get this up and running. Since this machine is badly yellowed and uneven, my first thought was to give it a good cleaning and the usual retrobrite treatment. Lately, I've seen people having good results using sun brighting without peroxide at all, so I thought maybe I'd give it a try and see if it works or not. After a good rinse in the sink, the parts get placed out in the driveway for a healthy dose of mid-Atlantic sunshine. Since the machine didn't come with a keyboard, I got back on eBay. Well, truth be told, I'm never really not on eBay. After months of searching for something that wasn't as expensive as the computer itself, I made an offer on this untested but decent looking part for $60. The seller claimed that it was very nice and he didn't think there would be any issues. The part arrived in good shape by outward appearances. There was a small rattle inside the housing, but it didn't seem like anything major. Also, it was covered in some fine grit that made even touching it unpleasant. This thing is going to need a full, deep cleaning, so first things first.
Okay, time to open it up to clean inside and see what's causing that rattle. Uh-oh, what the heck is this awfulness now? Uh, yeah, I'm not loving what I'm seeing here. This has clearly been exposed to water, bugs, who knows what else, and not for a short amount of time either. I don't know how badly damaged this is yet, but I'm certain some of these traces are toast. The words, don't judge a book by its cover, and caveat emptor come to mind. This is probably going to be futile, but let's see how much of this is just on the surface. Yeah, that's what I thought. Just about none of it. This calls for drastic measures. First things first, let's get all the nasty plastic parts in for a good soaking in warm water with dish soap. Let's pretend for now that the PCB can be salvaged and press on with the rest of the cleaning. One of the keycaps didn't pop off, the whole plunger assembly snapped out instead. Living up to its name, at least. But good news! The broken tab that holds the key in place on the PCB was the cause of the rattling sound, and it looks to be an easy fix with just some super glue. Some of the keyboard screws are pretty rusty, so I'll toss them in some white vinegar and see if they can be brought back. Okay, while these dry, I'm going to move on to the next project and think about how to tackle the rest of the keyboard. I'm considering tossing the PCB straight into the dishwasher and then trying to salvage whatever's left when it comes out. Ideas or comments? I'd love to hear them. Next up, let's dive into why the machine itself doesn't power on. Someone's already been in here messing around because the power leads from the supply to the fan and motherboard have already been disconnected. The first thing I'm going to test is whether or not there's DC voltage on any of the outputs. This supply delivers plus 5, plus 12, and minus 12 volts to the motherboard, as well as plus 5 volts to the floppy drive Molex connectors. Nothing here. Nothing there. Nothing there. Nothing at all. How about here? Nope, nothing here either. Beep. 
Just to rule the obvious things out, let me test the power switch and make sure there's continuity. All right, that all checks out. Next, I'm going to have to extract the board for a closer look. There's also a fuse on there, so let me rule that out as well. I was hoping it was going to be something easy to identify and fix. Oh well. Moving on, I don't see any bulging or leaking caps, nor are there any signs of catastrophic component failure. There are clear indications that some of the solder joints on the main connector have failed. I retested the traces directly, and there's still no voltage present, but I'll definitely be reworking these pins before this is all over. So, with the most obvious problems eliminated, I turn to the machine's service manual, which has a comprehensive list of steps for troubleshooting a failed power supply. I don't have some of the required test equipment, namely a variable AC power supply, isolation transformer, or a scope, so I'm only going to be able to get so far with this procedure. Step 1. Check the fuse. Done. Step 2. Check diode D1, D4, and transistor Q1. Did that? Step 3. Check for shorted rectifiers or caps. Nothing. Step four and beyond require the tools I don't have. So my options now are to recap and cross my fingers or to graft in a modern unit. There don't appear to be any off the shelf replacements for the system, so it will have to be a custom job. Hey, it's not all bad news today. Let's see how our sun brighting experiment went. What you're about to see is the result of five full days of direct sun. So, without further ado... I'm really happy with how this turned out. It's not completely restored yet, but it's come a long way. The process is much slower than retrobriting, but there's less risk of streaking or splotchy results either. I'm going to call this a resounding success. Okay, let's recap. A bunch of things didn't go to plan today. But that's all part of the fun, right? So there's definitely going to be a part two. And in it, we'll tackle the power supply, attempt to salvage the keyboard PCB, test the hard card and RAM expansion, install and configure an XT IDE compact flash drive, replace the damaged ISA slot, and with a little luck, take a fully functional Tandy 1000 for a test drive. So I think that's gonna do it for today. If you don't wanna miss out on part two, please do consider pressing one of the lovely buttons below. I hope you enjoyed this bit Thanks to my awesome patrons for their support. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Retro Bits.